Uh, my name is Mike Fowler. I'm in chemical engineering. Royden Fraser has already introduced some of my research interests. Uh, some of my research interests, uh, my real research interest is generating high quality uh, what's called uh, professionals to enter the workplace, some of which you see in this room right now who are going on to do much better things than I could ever possibly do. So I'm going to go through a lot of slides, so don't blink because I'm going to do them very quickly, but I'm just going to try to give you an overview of some of my research interests. So when Royden spoke about what he called model-based design, we talk about software in the loop with essentially modeling, hardware in the loop where we test models and control systems, component in the loop where we actually test test various components and prototyping, and we've done all of this. My origin is really reliability of fuel cell materials and fuel cell stacks and reliability of electrochemical series. So unlike Linda, I don't invent new materials. I'm not interested uh, in new materials. My research doesn't lead to that. What I have is I have test chambers and I will test already what's commercially available out there. So this is a battery cycle and while I'm testing uh, what's called prismatic cells, the type of cells that you'd actually find in non-motive pattern uh, cells. Uh, right now I'm using a model that was based on Newman's model who's one of these electric leading electrochemists uh, and we're trying to model model uh, two types of chemistries that are commercially available, a Cocum's battery and an A123 battery, and people ask, why did you pick those two batteries? Because those are the two batteries I can get. One of the problems you have with doing battery research on commercially available batteries is that nobody can actually get their hands on those batteries. So getting their hands on those batteries is extremely difficult. So we've developed baseline models for both of them. We're looking at the idea of what we call path history or charge history, and yes, the charge history history dramatically affects the life of the batteries. The heat generation in the batteries dramatically affects the life of the batteries and the thermal balance and the capacity fade and power fade are what we're really interested in. So those, these are the aspects that we're trying to look at is how does the charging and the uh, discharging behavior in the batteries affect their life. And we're looking at both the thermal balance, heat generation as heat charge state of charge, charging rate, as all being factors that affect the lifetime. And you can obviously, the extension is, if you can understand how fast you charge them affects your lifetime, you can build better systems, you can build better control systems in order to manage these cells. Uh, so the pro, pro challenges are is the parameters and the kinetic data for specific chemistry of the battery are not easily available and not easy to measure. In a small cell, when you invent the materials and you work with the materials yourself and you invent it, yes, you can measure these types. But in a commercially available cell, these are difficult parameters to actually uh, uh, obtain. Uh, so there's certain uncertainty of the phenomena that are reported in the literature. Uh, of what's actually happening in these cells and you require multi-physics modeling because a number of different things are actually happening. So we've had uh, a few publications and what you're looking at here is essentially we're looking at a cycle pattern. So we go back, right back to the automotive cycle pattern. So we'll put in the, the type of history that the battery will actually see in a car. We'll cycle the battery through that pattern either 50 times or 500 times or 5,000 times to look at how long the battery is going to uh, last on that specific uh, profile. And we use different cycle patterns. We use uh, some of the traditional ones that are uh, you model cars on today, but we also are using trying to invent some of our own uh, cycle patterns. Uh, we have, uh, we build jigs, so this is the prismatic cells, we're putting uh, thermal couples on the cells and trying to measure the thermal history of those cells because the thermal history dramatically affects the lifetime of the actual battery. Uh, we've actually used uh, uh, vehicle modeling, so what you're seeing here is essentially the model of a vehicle where we can start from actually engines, transmissions, uh, moving through, which will have generators which will charge a battery. The battery can also be charged from the wall. You'll have 12 volt systems, which are your auxiliary power systems. We'll model the entire vehicle uh, and the lifetime of the vehicle, including different traction patterns, including different uh, uh, drive cycle patterns. 
Uh, one of the models that Royden and I are uh, most recently working on is our Echo Car 2, which is the Chevy Malibu. Uh, and we're modifying that with a ethanol motor in the front end. We have a battery charger and we have 18 kilowatt hours of battery there that we could actually charge from the battery. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the research associated with this a particular one, but we're actually prototyping this particular vehicle, uh, not only doing research on it. So what we did is we took the cells that we have in that vehicle, we ran them at different C rates, that's different C rates meaning the, the rate in which you discharge them or charge them, and we did it at various temperatures. By doing that, we can see how the capacity is affected and we can develop state of charge maps based on temperature, state of charge, and we develop these maps to actually generate a resistance for those batteries. And then we can use that resistance in our actual vehicle models in order to model. So once again, temperature, state of charge, and you can see that it, we did it both as a function of the state of charge, the charge rate, and of the temperature. So this research is ongoing. You can see that our model fits the experimental data uh, fairly well uh, that we actually have, except for at the very high ends. So once you get these batteries to very low states of charge or very high states of charge, they're much more difficult to uh, actually model and predict their performance because the phenomena starts to change a little bit. Uh, makes it a little more different. What's of most interest to the people in the audience is how far I can get with my vehicle. So if you look at your vehicle, if it's like today, and you have different patterns, so these are different drive patterns where US 06 is a very aggressive drive pattern. So that's the way I drive. Right? Whereas UDDCS might be the little old lady who goes to church every Sunday. Okay, uh, and so those different aggressive, uh, uh, so the very aggressive pattern, if you drive very aggressively and it's minus 10 like it is today, you aren't gonna be, get very far with your actual uh, electric range. Whereas if you drive less aggressively, you're gonna get much further. And looking over the life or the various temperatures, so we're looking at cold start, hot start of batteries, how far are you actually going to get in your vehicle based on these batteries, uh, looking at the modeling that we're doing for the batteries. Uh, this research I've also extended up because I knew I my audience is here to talk about some of my energy hub research. I started this research with Claudia Canazares a few years ago and I've carried on different types of energy hubs. Essentially an energy hub is where we bring in electricity, hydrogen, district heat, natural gas, we put it through a number of different transformations, meaning electrolyzers for the hydrogens, fuel cells to turn it back into electricity. And this is a hub that will actually transform the energy. So this is really what you're interested in. My interest lies heavily in hydrogen and electrochemical storage systems. Uh, we look at integrating these hubs in different networks and how we can move the different, what I call energy vectors, meaning electricity or hydrogen between the hubs. Uh, we've looked at a number of different models, both uh, 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 models for uh, industrial areas and for residential areas. Uh, one that is of interest is that we had uh, a farm that came to us and he was generating uh, biogas and he was turning that biogas into electricity and Hydro One was really friendly and wasn't letting him put it onto the grid. So he had nothing to do with his biogas that he was generating because they wouldn't, he couldn't get the electricity onto the grid. So we looked at taking the biogas and doing something alternatively with the biogas, essentially cleaning it up into natural gas with a technology called pressure swing absorption and dumping it into the natural gas grid. This has huge advantages for energy storage in the long term. Uh, and we can talk about different storage technologies, time scale, and the best way to store energy in a stationary point of view. So we've done a number of different uh, energy hub examples, both uh, looking at buildings, looking at industrial parks, and looking at, uh, with Claudio Canazares, looking at the overall transmission systems. Uh, this one was interesting because we looked at a small building, so a small energy hub where we had a couple wind turbines, we were buying electricity from the grid, we were buying hydrogen or selling it to the market, we were making the hydrogen in our building, and we were running the electricity in that building. But more importantly, we looked at a vehicle fleet. That vehicle fleet, 
uh, we looked at being what we're actually saying. It's not conventional vehicles. We looked at hybrid vehicles, but more importantly, we looked at plug-in hybrid vehicles and plug-in fuel cell vehicles. So our vehicle fleet consisted in this particular building. It was a standard industrial, light industrial facility. We looked at 10 vehicles, 20 vehicles overall in our fleet, 10 vehicles charged overnight, 10 vehicles charged in the afternoon. We were looking at integrating the wind and the solar on the building and the grid electricity and refueling these vehicles with either hydrogen or with plugging them in to recharge them and seeing what did it make more sense to do, to make hydrogen or to recharge your vehicle at different times of the day. And you can see that it, depending on how you have it, whether you have what we call controlled charging or uncontrolled charging, will dramatically affect how much electricity you have to waste, how much it actually costs you to refuel your fleet, and uh, whether it makes more sense to make the hydrogen to refuel your vehicles or to actually plug in your vehicles at various times of the day. So we didn't explore this in detail, but this preliminary model just to show how you can balance different types of energy systems from both the electrical storage in a building to your actual vehicle fleet. I, uh, and we modeled it based on a vehicle that Dr. Frazier and myself actually built, uh, which was here. Uh, and actually, I have to say, Dr. Frazier and myself actually did absolutely nothing. Matt Stevens' blood is literally in that vehicle. <laughs> and, and I can show you where the blood spots are. <laughs> right? uh, we did go on to build a second vehicle built on uh, uh, plug-in hybrid technology. So this was a fuel cell vehicle, but it also had 13 kilowatt hours of plug-in hybrid. So we could either plug it into the wall or refuel it from hydrogen. And uh, this vehicle uh, was quite uh, effective. I was particularly impressed with this team considering that they had a voltage spike and fried virtually every piece of electronics in the vehicle two weeks before the competition. And they were able to totally rebuild the vehicle on the first three days of the competition. I, I've also looked at residential refueling with hydrogen. So trying to refuel a fleet and looking at integrating hydrogen into the fleet. There is a student competition that's down in the States, which we like to enter, a uh, uh, hydrogen student competition. So this was in 2011. We won this uh, particular competition. The interesting thing about this particular residential uh, uh, building that won the competition for us is that we put a gymnasium in the building, and the gymnasium actually had little bicycles that would actually recharge and generate hydrogen and to help refuel the vehicles. And people were particularly impressed with that. We were quite upfront with it in the report, in the presentation, that that generated 0.003% of your hydrogen. But <laughs> they found that particularly effective and they, it allowed us to win the competition. So we were quite happy with that. We deal with architecture students, so we actually said that what would be the actual siting of the building and actually designing the building and putting the building on North Campus. Uh, actually, we've done this and we're very careful about doing this in the future when we write our reports because somebody picked our earlier competition report up off the internet about five or six years ago and it was a reporter who wrote an article about it and then I got a phone call from the head of the regional municipality who said, what are you doing with my my landfill gas on your site. And I said, well, you know, we just did a competition. We just pretended we got your landfill gas. Well, this article says you got it, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, they never really actually did their fact checking. Uh, so we've done a number of different uh, facilities on this. We actually do the process flow diagrams, looking at both the electrical generation and the hydrogen generation in them. Uh, after entering that competition for a number of years, we won it two years out of six, finished second three of the other uh, years. Uh, we decided to enter a different type of competition. That was an engineering competition. It was a really nice competition. They gave us a nice trip to Washington, uh, free uh, conference proceedings, free lunch at the conference, so a really nice trip. Instead of that, we decided to enter this competition that was sponsored by Walmart, 
And in this competition, we looked at integrating wind solar into a green energy hub and generating hydrogen to actually refuel their forklifts. So Walmart has commercialized uh, forklift power, uh, hydrogen forklift power in, not, they haven't commercialized it, but they're using it in a facility outside Calgary where they run 89 forklifts on hydrogen. And what we said is, well, what if we could do a green, 100% renewable electricity for that, high, uh, for that fuel cell, uh, for those fuel cell forklifts. And they're very interested in that. So we looked at designing their new facility and we looked at it from an integrated point of view, integrating wind, solar, grid electricity, the turbines, photovoltaics. We looked at the actual energy generation in the building, the lighting, chillers, uh, what was called ice bear technology where we made ice when the electricity was cheap uh, for the refrigeration. And their, their refrigerators are big, like their refrigerators are like four or five warehouse size. Uh, we did uh, a simulation of this particular facility. So we looked at when do you have wind, when do you have solar, when do you, have, uh, when do you make hydrogen, when do you actually recharge uh, your batteries, when do you run the electricity, uh, when do you uh, actually do the cooling, and we did load leveling uh, over that. The nice thing about that particular competition is that it was not an engineering competition. It was judged by the CEOs of Maple Leaf Foods, Walmart, uh, uh, Coca-Cola Canada. And when you enter these competitions that are judged by CEOs and it's not engineering competitions, the prize isn't a nice trip to a conference, the prize is $30,000. So those students took home quite a, a little bit of cash for that competition. So that entering business competition uh, makes sense. We've done large scale energy hubs uh, modeling and I'm not going to get into this in too much of detail because this is older when we were looking at increasing your demand in in uh, Ontario. But the real problem that you have is that you now have intermittent renewables. How do we actually solve the problem with those intermittent renewables? Well, how they're solving it is that for every windmill that you put out that's one megawatt, you have to have backup power that's one megawatt. Well, where do you get that backup power? Well, you're probably going to get that from a natural gas peaking plant. What I'm proposing is take that backup power and make hydrogen and refuel your vehicles or use that to recharge your electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles. So it allows you to flexibly control the source of electricity and follow the demand. You replace your coal with nuclear. Uh, you know, hydrogen can be converted back into electricity during the peak hours. Now, the, the people who say, well, this doesn't make sense, say, well, the problem is, is that hydrogen has a round trip efficiency, meaning taking the electricity, making the hydrogen, uh, putting it back into uh, a fuel cell to turn it back into electricity. The round trip efficiency is about 30 to 35 percent. And they say that's too low, where the round trip efficiency on a battery is much higher. You're probably going to get about 80 to 90 percent, if not higher, on a battery system for the round trip efficiency. So does it make sense? The advantage of this is another one that I'm going to get into here uh, is that you can actually take the hydrogen and I can store it. So when the wind blows, and in Ontario, the wind blows in January and February. We have lots of electricity in January and February. We don't need any of that wind uh, electricity. But I can store that hydrogen underground at virtually no cost because I already have the underground storage in place. And I can compare that to different types of technology, the battery storage, Linda talked about the sodium sulfur battery, which is sort of commercialized. There's compressed air technologies, there's pumped hydro technologies, and there's hydrogen technologies. We can talk about the different types of technologies. But for the actual storage volume that you're going to have, you're going to get most of your storage in hydrogen and it allows you to do seasonally storage. So what you're looking at here is for the same area of land, I have either pumped hydro is that little blue box, compressed air is that little red box, that's how much energy I can actually store in that same area of line, land, I can store that much energy in hydrogen. Now, does that make sense from you as a local electricity supplier? 
Probably not, because this is long-term seasonal storage that I'm talking about. If you're looking at daily load leveling, you probably want to use batteries in a local area, in the local transmission area. This is more for on the transmission side. So we're looking at trying to model the power grid through electrolyzers, compressing it, putting it into underground storage, then either separating the hydrogen out and refueling vehicles once they come online, or putting it straight into gas, natural gas turbines to generate the electricity. There are advantages of mixing hydrogen with natural gas in the turbines in that it actually lowers some of your uh, key criteria emissions, specifically the NOx value. So it looked at that. And we've looked at how much hydrogen you're actually going to have. You're going to generate about 10% hydrogen if you buy your electricity at six cents a kilowatt, where you'll get about 2% in your reservoir if you buy it at one cents a kilowatt. So we're looking at different ways of interacting with the, uh, the natural gas grid and where we're actually going to store it and where we're going to store that. Uh, so that's just about it. So I'm interested really in electrochemical storage and commercial batteries that are actually available. Okay, questions? That's 10 minutes. Questions? People were asking about path history of batteries. Yes, you get them hot, they hit 60 degrees, they're probably dead. Yes, if you have them fully state of charge, you know, pretty near 100% state of charge and you try to put more charge in them, they're going to overheat and they aren't going to be very nice on your airplane. Yes, if you try rapidly charging these batteries when they're near full state of charge, the batteries are probably going to die. Yes? On that range graph that you showed, was that including auxiliary load or no auxiliary load? That included auxiliary load. So how come when it got really hot, the, load, the range didn't start going down because of the AC? You uh, crank the AC when it's 50 Celsius. We didn't crank the AC. We, we left off AC. So it included normal auxiliary load, but not the AC load. Right? And we haven't included what I call thermal ramp rate. So when we actually operate these, vehicle, these batteries in your vehicle, so if you drive your Chevy Volt, the Volt is going to operate that battery at 25 degrees C. It's going to reach the temperature and it's going to put it at a nice happy temperature and it's either going to have heating or cooling to operate at a nice happy temperature. So if you start in Arizona and it's at 40 degrees, you've got to cool that battery down. If you start in a day like today and it's minus 10 degrees, you've got to heat that battery up. Right? So yes, we include some of the auxiliaries in the model, but not all the auxiliaries. And we didn't include what I call the hard auxiliaries because the hard auxiliaries virtually kill your battery right away. So if you start at minus 10 and you try to heat your car, your battery's dead. If you start at 40 and you try to cool your car, your battery's dead. So those hard auxiliaries we did not include. We included basic auxiliaries, meaning radio, the light auxiliaries, the basic operation auxiliaries. In that particular model. That yeah. Point here. Um, you can cycle the battery at 60 degrees and it's not going to die. Yeah. Most companies routinely cycle at 55. 55. Over long, long cycles. Long cycles. You keep the battery charged at 60 degrees for an extended period of time and you're going to run into problems. And it's not instantaneous death. Usually no. it's just compromising cells. So you want to be a little careful about that. Yeah. Them. So it's compromising cells. So but it's it, most battery manufacturers routinely cycle at yeah. The A123, not, I mean, those lithium iron phosphate type cells that are in the A123 cell will certainly sustain that over thousands of cycles of that temperature. Yeah. Uh, and A123 was a good try at commercialization. So A123 is a good example of commercialization. Uh, U.S. government invested, what, half a billion dollars in A123? 360 million. 360 million dollars in A123, and they went bankrupt last year, or last month. Right. Uh, long story. It's a long story. Yeah, it's a very long story. All right. Uh, and, and, and yes, so yes, I, I was harsh, but s certainly the thermal history of the battery is dramatic. And you've got to be very careful and manage the thermal history of batteries. That's not why 
No, that's not why anyone's with anyone very good. But there are other issues associated with that. So it might even be better for A123. They got by, bought by, the technology got bought by a real automotive company, Johnson Controls, who really knows how to build automotive parts. So maybe it'll come back stronger and better.